I saw my baby, she was turning blue. Oh, I knew that soon her young life was through. And so I got down on my knees down by her bed. And these are the words to her I said. Everyone will be all right tonight. Everyone will be all right. Rest in peace, David Jones, and on to the new season of The Andy Darer Show. His skin is white just like a ghost, thick Irish roots and his blonde hair, and he sounds like a Chicago super fan. A music nerd with a collection of CDs from here to there. Yes, Andy Dare is in Chicago, interviewing and barbecuing. It's the Andy Dare Show. It's the Andy Andy Dare Show. Welcome to the Andy Dare Show. I'm your host, Andy. Today it is episode 160. It's a brand new year. It's a brand new season of shows. We've got a ton of cool guests lined up. Today I am so honored to be able to chat with Jad Fair. He is a founding member of the band Half Japanese, and they have been making cutting-edge sounds since all the way back in the mid-70s. They've got a real interesting story. He's a master collaborator, too. He's, uh, he's worked with Daniel Johnston. He's worked with uh, our friends the Teenage Fan Club. And just a really individual, cool story that you don't hear that much nowadays. But Jad Fair is a total original. Um, if you want to learn more about them, I would say check out this documentary that actually came out 20 years ago. But um, it's still really uh, an eye-opener and a real cool uh, depiction of the whole DIY scene um, of the band Half Japanese. It's called Half Japanese, the band that would be king. And right now it is streaming on YouTube. Um, I would definitely suggest going to the website and purchasing it. Um, And as well as you're at that, you should uh, definitely check out Half Japanese and their brand new album. It's called Perfect. And, yeah, we've been jamming to this this whole past week. Um, It came out last week. It is a hard-hitting dose of loud rock meets cool poetic lyrics meets um, just extravagant sounds and just a whole bunch of interesting things added to the whole stew of Half Japanese. And, yeah, it's really cool to see that they're still doing it. Um, He's got an interesting story living in Athens, Tech, or in, not in Athens, in Austin, Texas, excuse me. Um, just a cool story and uh, just an interesting guy. So I would definitely uh, tell you to check out the interview, what's coming up next. I'm going to keep my spiel short today um, since it's the first episode of the new year. We're going to keep it also sponsor-free and commercial-free. So thank you so much for checking out the Andy Dare Show. It's going to turn five years old in a couple weeks And it's because you guys clicking through our Amazon link, you guys checking it out, telling a friend, and checking out andydare.com. I've got podcasts up. I've got a whole network of podcasts. I've got the Jay Porks Experience. Actually, now it's called the Jay Porks Podcast. That's out of Staten Island, New York. 
Um, I've got Jesse Unplugged, hosted by Jesse Anderson. He's brother to Billy Corgan. He's also just a really interesting guy himself. Um, that's once a month. And I've got Spin Class, my uh, hip-hop album. We dissect a classic hip-hop album from the 80s or 90s um, every couple weeks. That's with Tyler Kale. So you can find out all about this stuff at andydare.com. And I thought, why not read you one of my latest uh, articles that I just published over at EmptyLighthouse.com. I want to thank Chicagoist and Empty Lighthouse for being a place where I can put my thoughts and reviews about live shows, records, interviews with musicians. It's a nice outlet to have. want to thank them so much. And yeah, Paul Westerberg. One of these, another original songwriter guys that's been doing it for 30 years. His story comes out of Minneapolis and uh, The Replacements. What can you say about that band? While never really having a crossover hit, they built such a body of work. And then Paul even left them 25 years ago and has gone on to create beautiful works, beautiful complete albums, awesome singles. And now he's uh, joined together with Juliana Hatfield, and also a, a, a really cool uh, bassist in her own right and musician in her own right. So they are called the I Don't Cares. And uh, when I heard that they were teaming up, I said, this is a win-win. Let's uh, get an early copy. Let's uh, give a nice review for Empty Lighthouse. So I thought I'd uh, read the first couple paragraphs. But check it all out. It's at andydare.com. And, uh, yeah, here is my article. All right, published uh, January 25th, album review, The I Don't Cares, with their album Wild Stab. Minneapolis was a magical place in the early 80s. Sure, Seattle defined popular music in the early 90s, and Detroit defined it for the civil rights movement, but no scene had the range that Minneapolis provided during the Reagan days. From DIY funk music, Prince, and The Time, to abrasive punk, Husker Du, to horn-infused pop, The Suburbs, all these desperate ent entities were allowed room to flourish. Where Soul Asylum would embody the whole punk band gets signed and has a hit with a non-typical ballad, Cliché, a.k.a. Runaway Train, they were actually the first band to do that successfully from the area. Husker Du thrived with a soul-bearing yet catchy take on punk rock up until 1987 when they signed to Warner Brothers and quickly imploded. The replacements, with their shambolic lead singer-songwriter, Paul Westerberg, did a similar move in the late 80s. Signing to Sire and firing their light, Lightning in a Bottle lead guitarist Bob Stinson, they released a few nearly adult contemporary albums with diminishing returns up until their final show at the Taste of Chicago, 1991. Little did the band know that 1991 would actually usher in a complete sea change for alternative rock music. Making the classic replacements albums like 1984's Let It Be and 1985's Tim touchstones for a new generation of apathetic slackers. If they could have held on like Soul Asylum, perhaps they would have had the pleasure of reaping just what they had sowed for years. Westerberg went on to have a solo career and given the lead track off the iconic soundtrack to Singles, so there was a sense that he was finally respected as a godfather to the grunge era. After spending the past 20 years mining a melodic yet scrappy sound with a string of moderately successful solo records, he reformed the late 80s versions of The Replacements to play a few festivals such as an amazing 2013 stop at Chicago's Riot Fest. However, Westerberg remains cynical of, of the greatest hit circuit. To him it felt like a cheap payday, and after the last stop of the tour during last summer, he proclaimed it the end of The Replacements. This time for good. So in late 2015, when Paul announced a collaboration with Juliana Hatfield, the I Don't Cares, it was certainly manna for any fan of late 80s college rock. Juliana, certainly a powerhouse herself, embodied the detached cool of the era, making noise with the Blake Babies, the Lemonheads, and the Juliana Hatfield 3. Her bass work and cooing backups really set the Lemonheads Breakthrough album, It's a Shame About Ray, into the stratosphere of classic albums. All right, that's just a little excerpt. If you want to check out the whole thing, obviously go to andydare.com. Um, there's a link to it. Lots of, uh, lots of reads on that article, thanks to Empty Lighthouse. Um, want to thank everybody who uh, stayed with us during the winter break. Um, what a terrible time for uh, 
rock music. I mean, the loss of David Bowie just came out of a completely nowhere. Um, I had just reviewed the album, and I was completely uh, obsessed with the album. Um, I had it a week early, and I felt like I had something in my pocket that nobody else had, and I was just excited for the world, world to hear it, excited to review it. Um, I did, and it was published, and then... Um, yeah, two days later on on uh, Sunday night, David Bowie passed away at the age of 69, and that was just a complete shock. And um, yeah, I was in mourning for a long time, still am. And it, but at, there was a sense at a certain point that it was his final act, and that he was leaving us just the way he was the entire time he was here, always uh, creating a spectacle, always uh, doing something that you wouldn't expect next. So yeah, he did something that we didn't expect. And he left us, and way too early. And uh, yeah, a bunch of other rockers too. Um, hopefully, this will this will uh, take a little rest sometime soon. But yeah, Glenn Fry. Then you had a whole bunch of people. I don't want to go go into it because it's been like six or seven. Scott Weiland last year. So it's been a tough time for rock and roll music. Um, I'm so glad you guys were able to stay with us over the break. And uh, do check out Jesse Unplugged. Do check out the Jay Porks podcast. And, of course, check out Half Japanese and Jad Fair. And without further ado, my in-depth interview with Jad Fair. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for checking out The Andy Dare Show. Today it is episode 160. It's our first of the new year, and I'm so psyched to be joined by Jad Fair. How you doing? I'm doing real well. I'm pleased to be on your show, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Hey, no problem. It's actually I've actually been a fan for about 20 years now, um, going to CD stores, vinyl stores, and uh, finding your guys' stuff, and I'm delving in, and all the collaborations throughout the years. But actually, we're here to talk about the brand new Half Japanese album released last week called Perfect. Um, it's an awesome listen. I highly recommend it. Where did you guys record that? Uh, it was uh, recorded in, in France, in uh, Toulouse. Nice. Or, or just, out, just outside of Toulouse. Are we talking before the tragedies and all that, or during? Uh, well, m- m- it was before that. It was before that. Got you. So you guys were out of there before that happened. Yeah, and, and Toulouse is far enough south that it, it was not... Um, it, it, it's quite a distance from Paris. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, it's it's a really warm sounding record. Are you, I'm guessing on uh, analog equipment or. Uh, well, yes and no. It it, it went through a uh, uh, analog, uh, but then it went to digital for the mix down. Sure. Okay. And uh, did you guys self produce it? Did you bring in an outsider? How did you produce the thing? Uh, well, um, John uh, Dieterich from uh, uh, Deerhoof. Oh, nice. Did the, uh, the mixing and, and production work on it. And, boy, he did a real fine job. And uh, John did the uh, the last Half Japanese album as, um, as well. Gotcha. So, yeah, and there's been two uh, Half Japanese albums since you guys took the hi- the extended hiatus. Um, how would you explain the differences between Half Japanese now and Half Japanese, say, uh, mid-'90s? Or is there not uh, much well, difference? <laughs> Not not a whole lot of difference. Uh, this um, band lineup is the same as on the uh, album Hot, which came out in uh, what about the '96? I think we recorded that. Uh, so we've we've been together uh, with this lineup for many many years, and even those those um, years that we um, didn't release uh, in any albums, we still got together for some tours. We had one in Japan and a couple in Europe. Um, So no recording during that time um, stretched, but we still got together for shows. I feel like there's a kind of thing of where half Japanese didn't get the dude they deserved in, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. You guys stuck out like a sore thumb pretty much in the the music industry. And now I feel like people are slowly catching up to the whole sound. And I'm hearing you guys' sounds mimicked all over new music, it seems like. Are you feeling the influence that you guys set out 20, 30 years ago? Are you feeling it in the new music at all that you're hearing? Yeah, yeah I do. I, I'm, although, boy, I, I, 
Well, I live in, in uh, just outside of Austin, and uh, I, I don't listen to much radio, and when I do, it's usually the stations from Mexico. Yeah, okay. uh, so I'm a little bit out of the loop as, as to um, uh, new mu- music. There's such a vibrant scene in Austin. Um, how long have you lived there for? Uh, well, it's been, what, about 16 years. Oh, nice. Um, Actually, 16 years ago, I think it was kind of like a budding scene, but now it's, I guess they say it's one of the hippest towns in America right now. But uh, 16 years ago, I think they were still, uh, you know, setting up festivals, setting up venues, things like that. Do you do you feel the growth of Austin? Oh, man, it's it's just huge now. I mean, the uh, South by Southwest Music Festival is by far the, the biggest uh, music festival I've ever seen. Sure. Um, I mean, it's like, you know, thousands of bands. It's crazy. That's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, you guys, uh, so in Austin, you guys play play around a lot, or uh, are you get, is there any plans of taking this album on, on tour? Uh, well, with, with, with uh, Half Japanese, we usually need to have a festival uh, show first, and then we'll um, kind of work out the shows kinks around the festival. Yeah. Well, well, well not, not so much that, but just it, it's expensive to get it, everyone in the same uh, town <laughs> sure. uh, because we all live in uh, different cities and actually different countries, too. Um, Gio lives in France. Uh, Mick lives in uh, England. Um, so, yeah, it, it really does take some doing to get us all together. That's really funny. I've never heard of that where there's people in different continents and everything like that. But for, for the album, you guys were all in the same room at the same time? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice, because you can, um, you can kind of I've, tell when people piece it together and send tracks over email and stuff like that. I mean, that's good to, like, practice a song out, but when you're actually recording it, it is nice, and you can feel it when the band is all in the same room or at least same studio. Yeah. Well, quite a few of the overdubs were done at home studios. But for the the basic tracks, uh, we do like to be all together. Nice. Do you have a uh, a decent setup at at home too? Well, it's um all right. I mean, it's you know just um, Pro Tools, um, but it's a very basic nice um, setup. <laughs> I actually I put the vocals on this show through a Tascam four track to keep it a little. A little punk DIY, even though I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> okay, well, good. even though I'm going to throw this up on the internet and probably tweet it out, but I, I still like to have one foot in the DIY scene, you know. <laughs> okay, excellent, good, good. How about Joyful Noise? How did you end up uh, um, working with those guys at that record label? Well, I, I first did a, uh, a record with a, a band from France, uh, Hi Fi Club, and and um, they had connections with Joyful Noise, and then. Um, after that, which I'm, I was real pleased with uh, the um, uh, packaging that they did, and then when when it came time to release an, another album, we were looking at Joyful Noise, and we were also looking at uh, Fire Records, and uh, we decided for uh, these last two albums to do it with Joyful Noise. And Fire, and, and is fire out of uh, Fire's out of Ohio, right? Uh, no, it's uh, London-based. Oh, it's London-based. Okay, I thought. Okay. And then they also have a, a U.S. office just outside of uh, D.C. Oh, nice. Okay, but joyful noise for these two albums, and I really like how they have kind of brought back like flexi discs and the cassette scene and all that's palpable media stuff. I like still uh, buying an album. I like having reading the liner notes. I have like four thousand CDs. I got a vinyl collection. I, I just like I just don't like buying something on iTunes. You download it and then your computer freezes and then it's gone. I like right, I still right. like palpable media. Are you the same way? Well, I, 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 I listen to most of my music. I, I listen through a uh, um, iPod. Um, so I don't really play that many uh, uh, CDs or LPs. It, it, it's more through uh, through uh, iTunes. Um, yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, are there still like good record stores in Austin? Though no? there's got to be, right? Oh yeah, uh, Waterloo Records is is great, and uh, um, yeah, there's some really fine ones. Yeah, something about the hunt of finding stuff, and especially half Japanese back uh, 20 years ago. 
it was hard finding your stuff in stores. And then when you did find a used copy, it would be pretty expensive stuff. And uh, but it was it would be worth it because you'd be the only one of your friends. Oh, and you'd be the cool guy. Hey, have you heard of half Japanese? And then you turn on another fan. And um, it's it is the thrill of the hunt for me a, a little bit. And uh, yeah, uh, this one's in stores now. Uh, perfect. I love the artwork. You've uh, you've been long time in the art world. You do paper cuttings and stuff like that. Um, what kind of release is art for you? Is this is this something that's every day and music is every week or something? Is it what's more important in your heart, music or art, or is it a? Comp- well, I'm, I'm really kind of need, need both of them because it would be so difficult to make a living off of just music, and unless I was out touring, you know, a good bit, sure. which I don't really wish to do because I, you know, I like to stay at home. Um, and it would be difficult to make a living just off of um, art, but with the combination, it you know, I get by. Nice. That's really awesome. Yeah, uh, getting in the van and touring, I mean, after you've been doing it for 30 years, it's just, it's kind of a headache. Um, I could see playing a handful of shows here and there. That's probably the best bet. And I know bands that'll just go out one week a month. I think that's a nice thing, too, and then you can come back home. Um, you're in Austin, so you're kind of in the middle of the country, which is nice. Um, is it? Uh, do you still get the joy of playing live, or is it more of a headache now? Oh, I, I do enjoy playing live. Uh, with uh, Half Japanese, we, we do more shows um, over in Europe than we do in the U.S., and I'm, I think the reason for that is uh, music festivals. Sure. Hey, yo, Jay Porks here. I know you're keeping a lock to the Dare Network for all your podcast needs, whether that's the Andy Dare Show, the Tyler Kale Show, Jesse Unplugged, or the smooth, sultry tones of me, the Jay Porks Podcast. You keep a lock to AndyDare.com all throughout 2016 for all the luscious podcast action. All right, we are back with Jad Fair, and uh, yeah, we're talking about the new album, Perfect, Half Japanese, out now. You can go on iTunes, you can go on Amazon, and uh, yes, I wanted to actually take it back. Um, Half Japanese started in the mid-70s, right? Uh, How about like uh, your first um, recordings and stuff like that? Was it something that you did in high school? How did did Half Japanese start? Uh, Well, it it was actually during um, college. Uh, My my brother and I uh, were staying at the same, uh, rented a a house um, just outside of the uh, the college um, area, um, which the house was out in the country, so we were able to play music any time of the day because there just weren't any neighbors around. And that's when we started uh, recording, and that would have been in uh, 74. Awesome. Yeah, I find like having your own place is like the most uh, wanted thing with a band because most people, they've got roommates, they've got parents that don't want to hear it, they've got neighbors right on top of each other. I've got my own house here and it was really, everybody wanted to come and jam at my place because I got my own house, I got a backyard. So yeah, I think the venue where you play is very important and not having, you know, any interruptions and stuff like that. Was that, was that the deal over at that place? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we could play any time of day, and we were so far away from any other house that it it, it just didn't make any difference what the volume was. That's awesome. Were you guys um, wholeheartedly into the punk movement where you wanted to be completely different from the arena rockers at the time? Is this the deal, or was it just you're trying to find your own path? More more of it just, like, comes uh, natural, Um, uh, although at the time um, we were listening to a lot of um, the Stooges and MC5 and Captain Beefheart, um, uh, Sun Ra, uh, so I'm, I'm sure that had a big influence on us. Everybody talks about the punk movement of the late '70s, but really there was, you know, inklings of that with the Velvet Underground, with the stuff you just mentioned, with free jazz, noise rock, all that stuff was. Not something created in 1978, though a lot of people like to think. I mean, it's it had had it had its base, you know, mid 60s, even back to the beat generation and stuff like that. You could claim was part of early punk movement, right? Well, yeah. I, I mean, my I think my the first record I ever bought was The Monkees. You know, when I was like 14. But then by the time I was 15, I bought a Sun Sun Ra album. 
That's rage. Um, nice. <laughs> so, you know, which, you know, I still listen to. Like, even the monkeys, I'm, I mean, you know, they were all right. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. every, everything's got its its usefulness, and if you have great songs, great songs are great songs no matter what, even if the band was put together for TV or something like that. They're still great songs, and they hold up. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it is funny how when you're a teenager, your tastes change, what, every couple months, it seems like, for most people, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But, boy, you know, I still listen to a lot of the stuff that I did when I was very young. Oh, yeah, certainly. And uh, so... You guys found us a, a, a following. You were able to do your own thing. You never really had to uh, bend at the will of a major label, right? Right, right. Which <laughs> um, I can't say that any major label ever, ever <laughs> tried to bend us. So. <laughs> and alternative tentacles wasn't trained. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Seems like a pretty, pretty free uh, experience with most of the people that you've worked with. And, oh, I think uh, so. Yeah. And yeah, about collaborating, um, it seems like you're always uh, finding new people to to collaborate with. I mean, I, I had Norman Blake on the show last year. You guys obviously. Boy, what a what a great guy! What an awesome dude! Um, yeah. How was working with Norman? Um, old a teenage pleasure. Fan club. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I did one album with Teenage Fan Club, and then uh, an EP with Teenage Fan Club, and then this last year, uh, Norman and I did an album together, and. Uh, yeah, Norman's uh, always such a um, pleasure to work with. That's awesome. Was this a thing of you guys meeting each other at one of these big festivals in, in Europe, or how did you guys meet? Uh, well, I mean, we first met um, when I was doing work with the uh, uh, the Pastels in oh, okay. uh, Glasgow. Nice. Uh, because uh, Norman, well, we uh, actually rec did the recording at Teenage Fan Club's uh, studio. Okay, cool. Nice. And uh, Norman played on on the record, and so did Jerry. Very cool. And uh, yeah, how about Daniel Johnston? What an original thinker! What a completely unique story. Um, people call him genius. I mean, stuff like that was, and that was back in 1989. Uh, it's spooky, is the the album, the collaboration. How was how was right, that? Right. Well, I, I first heard uh, Daniel, and uh, would have been about '86. When Half Japanese had a show in Austin, and uh, Jeff Tartikoff uh, gave me a cassette tape of Daniel, of the uh, Hello, How Are You? Nice. And, uh, you know, I get so many uh, cassettes given to me, but this one really struck something with me. Um, and, and, and it was on in heavy rotation in the, the van during that tour. Talk about an original, like, uh, as you said, combining art with music. Um, that kind of album cover looked like it was probably something that popped out at, at your eye a little bit, which is always important to have something that catches the eye and then drags you in, and then you listen to it, and then you're then you're stuck. You know, then you're you're a fan forever. Um, it, was, it was really cool how Daniel also combined artwork with music and his own original style. So that's you guys definitely have that in common, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Daniel's amazing. Is is he uh, an eccentric genius where it's it's almost uh, hard to hang out with him, or is he more uh, is he more relaxed than people uh, give him the credit for? Well, he he's both. You know, he, he's uh, he, he he's very can be very moody. So if he's in a good mood, he's very easy to to hang out with. Nice. Um, but if he's in a bad mood, he's certainly is in a bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away a little bit, but give me yeah, space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, just give him some time. Yeah. Uh, well, during uh, the recording of Spooky, when he, he would get kind of, you know, testy, you know, I'd say, well, you know, let's go get some pizza. Nice. And, um, you know, that usually... That, that would uh, re get him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. And, uh, yeah, so many collaborations... Is there one in your heart that sticks out amongst all of them, or is Half Japanese the one collaboration that is near, nearest and dearest to you? Well, certainly Half Japanese is is, is one that I, you know, I, I've spent so much time with these guys, and uh, um, we're great friends, so that really is something. Uh, the uh, albums I've, I've done with uh, the band from Tokyo, uh, Tennis Coats, I, I really enjoyed 
recording with them. Nice. And then the recordings with um, uh, Teenage Fan Club. And um, I was such a big fan of Velvet Underground that it was a real kick to be able to uh, record with uh, Mo Tucker. That's awesome. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. That is really awesome. Um, I think that's oh, pretty and- Yep. And Yola Tango, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Yola Tango. I forgot about that whole story, too. Yeah. Um, when was that? Was that early 2000s or mid-2000s? Uh, well, we started recording it, um, well, it would have been uh, around 98. Okay, and, um, uh, yeah, the song titles are based on, what, is newspaper uh, clippings? or? Yeah, well, well the, all the, the lyrics were by my brother, uh, David. Okay, nice. And kind of based on like National Enquirer, <laughs> nice. kind of kind of things. That's really awesome. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty nice note to end on. Um, you said you'd probably be hitting a festival before you start a tour on the new album. Is there any plans of a festival booked already for uh, 2016? No, we don't. Don't. Um, so I really don't know. Nice. Well, um, we'll keep our eyes open and uh, hopefully. Well, um, Actually, I, I will be playing at a, uh, a solo show at a festival in uh, Indianapolis oh, nice. at the uh, end, of, end of March. End of March. You know what that's called? or It's called uh, something, uh, Fountain Music or something like that. Nice. I'll find, I'll find uh, out about it and put a link up for it. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to thank you, man, for the bottom of my heart. This is a really cool chat. Thanks for taking the time out. and. Uh, oh. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, the new album's amazing. It's called Perfect, Half Japanese, Perfect, Out Now, Joyful Noise Recordings. Um, any last words, Jed? No, just, you know, th- thank you so much. And, uh, you know, it's been a, a pleasure. All right. On behalf of Jad Fair, this is Andy signing off for The Andy Dare Show. This has been a presentation of The Andy Dare Show and Dare Network. Copyright 2016. All rights reserved. Thank you so much for listening. And please do check out andydare.com for more info.